Now, something you need to keep in mind is that as anglers, you always need to be aware that you have to downsize and you have to fish slower. Okay? What happens, and I just, I'll do it at all my seminars, four of them so far, and I sound like I'm a record repeating. But when fishing gets tough, if they're not biting or you've had conditions change or something happened, everybody says, well, they, they just, they, they bit really good and then they quit. Okay? Well, what happens if they were biting really good on this, correct? They ate the swim bait and then all of a sudden that quit. Well, what happens is just like Thanksgiving dinner, I'll say it again, you sit down at Thanksgiving, you eat a big meal, you're bloated, you don't want to eat no more, you complain about how much you ate. If you try to eat a whole other plate of that Thanksgiving dinner, you can't do it. But what? You can always put a slice of pie down, right? It's a smaller offering, tastes good, sweet, whatever, so you put it down. Think of a fish as the same way. When they're at peak feeding time, we've had walleyes take nine inch baits. Nine inch swim baits, they're, they're, they're much, much larger than that. When they're at optimal feeding time, they'll eat it. But once they've already took one of those down, they're not gonna be able to take another one of them down. So then what you have to do is go to a jerk bait that's fishing very slow, something that suspends, you're fishing it slow, you're letting it sit for a long period of time, you're basically teasing them into eating, eating it, just like when you get that slice of pie. All right, you're not going to let it go. You're, you're, you may set it to the side and it sits over there and go, oh, yeah, I'm going to eat that. That's good. Okay, you slow it down, you make it smaller, you'll keep the fish biting. All right, blade baiting. You guys blade bait in here for walleyes, any of you? In the wintertime coming up, middle of February, blade baiting is a big thing. All right, uh, north side of tackle blade baits, the Gimmick Sportsman's Warehouse, it's the best blade made. I use the tar out of them. Okay. You throw those out, you're ripping them in the morning. Boom, boom, the walleyes are crushing them. It's just a hunk of steel with lead on it, and you're fishing it hard. Then all of a sudden that quits, and you don't get nothing else. Well, what we do is we go to a Northland Oddball jig head with a Berkeley Gulp Gobi on it. We throw it in the same spots where we were fishing, and we lift. Where I'm ripping like this and putting it down, and ripping like that and putting it down, now I'm going like this. It's that fast. And that, that jig is just dragging. Then I reel down and I pause. Then I lift. It's a painful thing to do after coming off of doing something so aggressive. But what you're doing, they're still down there. But what you're doing now is putting something in them and they're just going, I just can't. It's, they're right up on it and it's barely, they can't resist it. So they eat it. So you always have to be aware of downsizing. I don't care if it's bass, pike, whatever it is. When they're feeding at their max, they're going to take big stuff down. But when they slow down, that's when you need to slow down and make things smaller. That is probably the biggest mistake that fishermen make. You may go out and, and you catch a, a fish with, say, this bait. You catch the biggest fish of your life. Well, guess what? Your confidence is through the roof, right? Biggest wall you've ever caught in your life. And you go back down there for the next three or four nights, and you just keep throwing and throwing and throwing because you caught that one big fish. There should be no fish of a lifetime. The fish of a lifetime, the first one you catch, tells you what to do and where they're at. Now it's up to you to repeat and go through the process of bait selection, downsizing, colors, and such, okay? So don't, when you get, when you get a big fish, don't just keep throwing. I see it steelhead and guy's got a jig, that's all I use. I use 15 different colors, 20 different colors a day, all right? Because I'm constantly changing up, going through my progression. Now something you need to know about color when you're fishing at night. With the walleye, because he can see good, all right? Typical colors that are going to work good at night, this is what they call a glow plug. If you've got low light conditions, this thing glows. Now, all your baits, you may look at this. This is, a, this is what they call a table rock shad. Well, we don't have table rock shad around here. When you go and you guys look at a bait wall, okay? When you look at a bait wall, you're going to see, this is a painted body right here, all right? That's painted. This is a chrome reflection, right? And now you've got it, and bring it, but you've got the baits that are transparent. We've all seen the transparent ones, okay? I don't care what the colors are. Well, I, it's got perch, I gotta make it a perch, I don't care. Here's how you make your colors. And this is go for daytime as well as for night, okay? If you've got moon and you've got some sky out there that's showing some light, you use the reflective right here, all right? 
Anytime you've got good light penetration in the water at Roosevelt's always clear generally. You don't have to worry about it getting muddied up unless it's in the spring and you're up the arm and such, okay? Anytime you've got good light conditions, you've got a bright moon, or in the daytime you've got good light, you want to use chrome. Chrome grabs the most amount of UV light to throw it off to make the bait stand out. If you've got low light conditions at night, there's no moon coming through, okay? It's uh, cloudy, whatever it may be. You want to use a painted surface. Now this one is an advantage because it's glow. So you can take and charge this up, and they've got the little chargers that you can buy. It's just like a flash for your camera. Charge it up, toss it out, and it's going to take that light and pound it out so it shows up. Now the transparent bait, you're not going to use transparent bait at night unless it's like a fire tiger. If you go look at some of my videos of the big fish we've caught, uh, Rapala glass shad wrap in a fire tiger. It's basically transparent, but it's got a chartreuse back and an orange belly. Now chartreuse at night, if you look at a color spectrum, the color that goes down to the water the furthest past 180 feet in optimal conditions is blue. When you look at a glacier, it's blue, correct? Why does the water always appear to be blue? How come when I look into that snow bank, it looks like it's blue? Well, it's a reflection, uh, it's a reflection of the sky. No, water cannot absorb blue. That's why things appear to be blue. That's why blue goes down 180 feet plus. The next color in the spectrum that shows up is green. Green is at 150 to 180, it starts to dissipate. Well, yellow and blue make green, correct? The next one up would be yellow. And then red goes away at 30 feet. All right? So what happens in low light conditions, something with a painted surface that is chartreuse, which glow is what color when it glows, looks like it's green, correct? Green or chartreuse, you could go out on a dark night with a chartreuse back and you're going to be able to see it visibly with your eye. It'll appear to be glowing out there because it grabs as much UV light that's out, even if it's just from the moon or the house up on the hill, it grabs it and you can see it. So a progression, let's just use this in the daytime, when I go cranking for bass or for walleye in the summertime cranking shorelines, when I first get up in the morning, our water is clear. When I first get up in the morning, the sun's not up yet. I'm going along the shoreline. I'm using a painted bait with a chartreuse back on it. As the sun starts to come up, because if you look at the surface of the water, look at it as a mirror. When our sun's over here coming up, this light is coming in and bouncing like this. It's being reflected up. The rays aren't penetrating down into there. So you want a bait that's going to stand out. So that's that painted surface with a chartreuse back. As this sun makes its way up here, what's happening? A little bit's getting reflected, but more of it's getting in. So now that chrome is starting to show up because it's grabbing that light and throwing it off. Now here's where the ghost, the ghost baits come in. We're here, right? So if I hit them good here, and I was doing great, and then I switched over, like you said, and I caught them on the chrome bait, and then it just quit. All right, here's what happens. You can overpower a bait with color, either being too bright, like the chartreuse back, or too flashy, like the chrome. Those ghost baits throw off very little light. Here's what's happening. You throw that bait out, and you're bringing it in, and it's working. Now, if it's really bright, guess what? They can see it. Okay? They can see it coming. When they're active, they're going to go and grab it. You change, you go with the chrome, they can still see it. When they become inactive, what you want to do is the bait to sneak up on them. So what's happening, they can hear it and feel it and sense it, but it's blending in. That clear bait is bending into its, or blending into its uh, surroundings until it gets right up on them. So they haven't had an opportunity to analyze it. Then when it gets up on them, they either got to make a decision to let it go or to take it. And being a fish, they're going to take it nine, nine times out of ten because it snuck up on them. So you're essentially sneaking it up. You look at baits, you say, Seth, well, why are some baits like this that have rattles and some are made out of balsa that have none? Well, the balsa is not making much noise. All it's doing is pushing water, sneaking up on them. They can't hear it coming away from the, great, the, the same distance. All right, it's sneaking up to them. So you can overpower a bait with rattles and with color. That's why you have those ghost patterns. If you have muddy conditions where the water's stained, you always want to use a painted body.
okay? Because the painted surface is going to grab the amount of UV light that's being put, penetrated into that mud and throw it off. That's why you watch the southern shows and everything's always bright colored. You know, you see that and guys go out and try to do it here. Our water here, if you're using jigs and stuff, you want to use naturals, greens, browns, that type of thing. You don't want to use bright, flashy stuff unless it's in the morning, low light, midday, jigs, you go to a natural color. So morning time, maybe you had a chartreuse tail. As the sun come up, you went to a straight brown, no chartreuse tail. Okay, you keep up with your conditions. All right, guys, we got, what, we got 15 minutes left, Dad? Have questions for you guys? Anybody got questions? Go ahead and fire away. Go ahead. No, nope, casting them out. And let me just talk to you real quick about the shoreline here, guys. I forgot to do that, and I'm glad you brought that up. You can troll these ones right here. You can troll these because they got the lip. So you control when you're trolling outside, you control the outside. But more than likely, most consistent bite to locate them when you're trolling is this, because you're trying to find them. So you, you want to pick up some smaller fish because you want to get on top of where the school is at. So a shad body like this or this type of body on lead core line, okay, when you're trolling out there. These are the bodies that you want. You're going to have a lot more luck that way, all right? These swim baits are when you're pinpointed. You know, they're up on that triangle by that swim beach, like I told you. The swim baits, that's when you want to run these. But this is a quick thing, guys, because I get that quite a bit, email-wise. If this is my shoreline right here, and we've got our transitions, and it's here, and we know the fish are sitting in here, and, and this is the, the triangle where the depth's starting to go from shallow to deep and on. We know all about that. Here's what guys do. If, if I paint, if I paint a fish on here, and there's a fish here, and there's a fish here, okay? Those are where your fish are at, all right? This is how everybody fish, fishes. They camp their boat out right here, and the buddy's in the back, and this guy's in the front, and they throw like this. Okay? And if this boat's 20 feet, that's 40 feet of shoreline. Okay? Well, how many fish did you come in contact with four casts? One. Yep, one or two. Okay? So then, here's what you want to do. And try not to ace your buddy in the back out. If you can get him up in the front of your boat, great. You want to park the boat like this. Now you made a cast, and with one cast, you're covering one or two fish each cast. What this is doing is it's keeping your product in the strike zone for the, the maximum amount of time. Fishing is about upping your odds, all right? So now you guys are firing down the shoreline, casting like this, and you're putting your product in front of a lot more fish that way. The other thing that this does, which is so important, if you're going like this, okay, here's what happens. They have very keen sense, and say you cast in here and this fish heard it, and he comes out to investigate it. Well, you move along, next thing you know you're throwing, you threw behind him, all right? When you're paralleling down like this, you may have got this fish's attention, and he comes in, and he's coming to it, and you brought him up towards the boat, and say he was right here when you pulled your offering out of the water. Well, you got him all wound up, full alert. The next time you cast, you're coming right in behind him. Now you're going to get him. You want to slow down when you're fishing. You, you're going down that bank. You know, if, I, if I'm uh, looking for fish, I'm moving really fast. But when I'm on these spots, like underneath the bridge there, I'm moving slow. I mean, you're just pounding the tar out of that area. Because you may draw their attention. If you move too fast, you move right by that fish. Because it's not uncommon for them, just like a pike, and at night, this is the only time it's going to happen, it's not uncommon for you to be sitting there and see one come up right underneath the boat and hit your stuff, right as you're pulling it out of the water. All right? You'll see them do it. Now, as far as lights, that's a question I get a lot. I don't run any lights. I'll turn my bow light on if I know there's other people out there. There's never anybody out there, so I don't have my bow light on. If somebody is running around, I flip it on. Okay? That's your call. I don't wear a headlight. I don't shine the shoreline, I put my electric motor down and I move really quiet. No banging on the bottom of the boat. None of that. Okay, because the sound travels at nighttime. And it's, it's not that it doesn't travel the same in the daytime. There's just something about the nighttime when you're out there. It's just quiet, period. There's nothing going on around you. Everything is quiet. 
So you want to be super quiet. You don't want to yell and scream. You just keep her down low, electric motor on 10 or 20%, and just move it along, making your cast. Okay? Now, the other thing you're going to want to do with your baits, Dr. Juice makes a tournament walleye scent, and I love it. I use it all the time. The reason why I use the scent on the hard baits, traditionally, if I'm cranking, you won't see me use that. But what I want to do at nighttime, so see if you're jerk bait fishing or something, if that fish is trying to locate it and he's hearing the sound and it gets in behind, then you leave an ascent trail, which is one more additional path to get him to your product. Okay? So always scent your baits.